All right, thank you everyone who's joining us for our webinar today. My name's Laura Katawaki, and I'm the Program and Operations Coordinator for United Way British Columbia. Today, the focus of our webinar is on unpaid family and friend caregiving, strategies for mobilizing an equitable health promotion approach. And so I think this is a very um, timely topic and of course a growing topic in Canada, as we do know that about one in five Canadians in the past year have provided some sort of uh, informal or unpaid care to a family member, a friend, a neighbor, or another individual. And this um, webinar that we're doing today is a part of a series of webinars that we've been hosting called the Core Canada Health Promotion Series. And so this series is based on the book, which you see pictured on the screen, Promoting the Health of Older Adults, the Canadian Experience. And so for this um, book, there's a chapter in the book, chapter 29, which focuses on caregiving. And so that's the inspiration for this webinar. And I would encourage you all, if you haven't had a chance to read this book, to um, find it at your local library or bookstore or um, order it online so that you can uh, read this book. And Irv, if you don't mind, uh, if you can just mute yourself. Thank you. And before we begin, I just do want to acknowledge that currently we're residing um, on the unceded and traditional territories of Indigenous peoples across Canada. For myself specifically, I'm currently working from the unceded ancestral and traditional territories of the Coquitlam First Nation. And so I would like to give acknowledgement and thanks to the Qu Coquitlam First Nation as caretakers of the land and for allowing us to um, live and work here. Before we get started with the presentations, just a few housekeeping details. So all of the audience members are going to be muted during the presentations and your cameras will be off. Um, but feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat box. And also, if you have any questions during the presentations, feel free to use the Q&A feature in order to ask your questions. We also will have a brief question and answer period at the end of the webinar as well. And I also just want to make sure everyone knows that the session is going to be recorded and it will be posted on Core Canada. And so afterwards, hopefully you'll have enjoyed the webinar enough that you're going to want to go back and watch it again or perhaps share it with your networks. So it will be available there. And then I just want to briefly go over the agenda for today. So today we're going to have four presenters. And so our first presenter is going to be Dr. Laura Funk, who is the author of the chapter in the health promotion book. And she's going to be giving an overview of the caregiving context in Canada. And then we're going to be followed by three um, presentations that are going to be on more specific aspects of the caregiving context. So we're going to have Dr. Katie Aubra, Dr. Jennifer Bombush and Zelda Fritas, and then we'll have our audience Q&A period. So to start off with then, I would like to introduce our first presenter, who is Dr. Laura Funk. So as a social and critical gerontologist, Laura examines how family carers make sense of their experiences, emotions, and identities within the changing context of care in Canada and in relation to our public understandings about aging, care, and responsibility. She is also well known for her research on system navigation, as well as a more recent study on dying at home. And in 2019, she received a recognition award from the Canadian Association on Gerontology for her research on unpaid care. And currently she's holding a Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences Research Professorship at the University of Manitoba. So Dr. Funk will be starting off the presentations. Thank you, Laura. Uh, 
Okay, I'm just gonna share my screen here before we get started. And I had to do this in two steps last time. I had to do this and then I had to stop sharing and then I had to reshare it like this. All right, so you're all seeing the correct version of the slides now. Um, all right, uh, so I, I'm gonna talk a bit today about caregiving contexts and why understanding those contexts uh, is important. Uh, for understanding carers' health. Um, so I'm speaking to you uh, today from Winnipeg. It's Treaty 1 territory and home of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, Dene, and Red River Métis peoples. Um, so also most of my research that's inspiring this talk today and, and, and inspired the, the book chapter uh, focuses on family friend care for older adults or dying persons. Although of course, many other people also receive unpaid care. Um, now, when I think of context of caregiving, as a sociologist, I think of the social context of society. And so that brings to mind, um, in particular, uh, in Canada, uh, decades of, of what's essentially been erosion or of public investments in health and social care sectors uh, intertwined with that uh, increased downloading of, of more medical and managerial tasks to families. Um, we also have a context that involves a lot of provincial and regional variation um, and fragmentations of supports between different sectors. Um, it's a context in which there's more emphasis on aging and dying in place uh, during a time in which we also have an aging population. Uh, and even farther back, you know, the shift away from sole income or earner households with more women moving into paid employment. And yet the persistence of the gendered valuation of women as best suited to provide family friend care. Um, and then we also are seeing the geographic dispersal of families. So migration is also uh, quite relevant here. And so these uh, different features of, of the social context uh, not only shape people's access to family friend care, um, but it shapes the everyday conditions of providing that care, um, including people's choices and abilities to either provide uh, care if they wish to or to set limits on that uh, without risking their health. Um, so there's a, I'll just briefly talk here about research um, on health and family friend care. And there's a few methodological um, challenges that would should be acknowledged. Um, first, there's some very large scale population based research that uh, tends to use very broad definitions of carers. Um, so some of this, the research that I found in the US had actually uh, noted that the overall sort of life expectancy rates of caregivers were uh, surpassed those of, of non caregivers. Um, but those studies use a very broad definition of caregivers, including people providing any, a wide range of levels and types of support. And so that's similar, for instance, when we hear definitions in Canada or statistics around, you know, 20 to 25 percent of people providing any care to uh, like an older family member or friend in like the last year. Um, uh, but there's a proportion of those who provide more intense care. Um, and so while the risk of, of negative impacts on health uh, of, of care provision are not, not universal by any means, uh, we know that they're typically higher among those for whom caregiving is more than an occasional or discretionary activity that it occupies a significant portion of time and energy. And one way we access information uh, about those carers is through survey research that often relies on non-random samples of caregivers who self-identify. And that's another methodological kind of snafu because uh, you know, our participants in, who, who volunteer for those studies, are they more likely to be the high intensity carers? Are they maybe less likely because they don't have time to participate? Uh, what does it mean when you know, we're not hearing from people who don't self-identify as caregivers? And we also know that a big problem in the research is that there's a lack of representation of LGBTQ persons, racialized immigrant carers, uh, and low-income carers. Um, so keeping those sort of uh, challenges in mind, there is a large volume of research on uh, caregiver burden and caregiver health. So fairly comfortably sort of bringing all that research together, we can say that there's a higher risk of of negative health impacts of care for uh, carers in who are co-resident providing very intense levels or forms of care in those in those uh, arrangements. Uh, carers of those with uh, multiple and complex needs, including dementia and maybe multiple chronic conditions. Um, carers providing, uh, you know, or carers who um, are juggling multiple competing responsibilities around work and so forth. Um, carers who already have serious health conditions of their own. Um, 
who have to maybe reduce uh, paid employment or have inflexible workplaces. Um, I would add also, I think when there's a lack of trust, when carers cannot trust the formal system to provide, to provide uh, effective or safe care, I think that's another piece of it. Um, and also when there are poor quality family friend relationships with the person for which you're providing care and wrapped up with that is when you're not perceiving it as a choice. Um, there's also some research indicating greater risk of poor health outcomes of caring among lower income persons, women, uh, racialized persons and new immig immigrants. Um, so groups with uh, less access to formal and informal supports and those experiencing um, multiple intersecting other stressors in their lives as well. Okay, catching up here on my slides, but we do, do need more research and attention needed to those inequities in particular, but also to the macro level context. And this is all challenging because those the effects of macro level forces on health are really difficult to, to kind of define easily and track through research. Um, so the, for those of you that are familiar with health promotion approaches, you've probably heard about a population health approach or social structural determinants of health um, that direct attention what we to what we call the kind of upstream level to root causes of, of poor health in populations as well as to inequities in this regard. Now thinking um, typically here, um, this would involve attention to those contextual forces that shape the circumstances of unpaid care uh, over people's lives, um, as well as carers' capacities, experiences, and, and, and ultimately health outcomes as well. Um, now, typically, most interventions to improve the health of carers tend to manifest as short-term programs for individual carers to prevent burnout. Uh, so things like counseling, support groups, problem-solving workshops. Um, these interventions target individuals and overall, um, I would argue they tend to have fairly mixed or limited outcomes. Um, it's perhaps not surprising that those interventions that are longer duration, multi-strategy, um, that address a more comprehensive range of needs are more beneficial for health outcomes. Um, however, the scale up into publicly funded standard care services and the uptake of interventions is also quite problematic. Um, from a health promotion perspective, these approaches also embed a downstream approach to promoting, uh, to promoting health or, or sort of preventing burnout and keeping people going as well. Um, so the other piece here is that from a rights-based perspective, um, uh, these approaches can also sort of embed assumptions that homogenize all carers as fully wanting to support their, their the family member uh, in every possible way and sort of uh, you know, assumptions around having a good relationship with the person and so forth. So when we think upstream, we're, we're not only wanting to move beyond individualized uh, sort of short-term solutions to, um, you know, uh, help a caregiver out so they can keep going. Um, but when we also bring and wed that with the kind of rights-based approach, uh, we also want approaches that um, orient to people, not just in their role as carers um, and about sustaining that role, but about um, orienting to them as, as, as full people uh, where the, all those aspects of their lives are also important to their social citizenship. Um, and I think we need to, oops, there we go consider also the health impacts of not only being unable to help or not being fully supported to help uh, per, per help your family family member as much as you would like to, uh, but also uh, the impacts of not being able to set limits or boundaries uh, if you wish to or need to. Um, and what happened in the COVID pandemic was probably a really stark example of those two extremes, right? So for uh, caregivers of persons in institutional settings being unable to help, what were the health impacts of that? Um, but also for those home-based carers who, for whom they didn't have access to home care services, for instance, um, how did that affect their health of, of not being able to have the respite and, and so forth? All right. Um, I've been thinking here about um, sort of three key features um, shaping the health of unpaid carers at that broad sort of root cause sort of um, level. Um, and, and, and the first here is sort of a category of dominant expectations and assumptions. 
uh, about care and about aging. Um, and we know that there are, tend to be very gendered or moralized assumptions um, circulating around care, for instance, um, and that these can become embedded in, in practices and policies, um, for instance. Um, you know, and as I mentioned, the, the assumption in particular that, that all carers are fully well themselves and fully healthy and able to be involved in care and that they have a good relationship with the care recipient uh, and so forth. Um, alternatively, some carers experience other situations about where they believe they're, they're, it, the assumption is the opposite, that they, they're actually sort of unable to provide care and they wish to provide care. Um, and I think a key piece here too is that context I mentioned earlier around the erosion of supports. And so that issue of the availability and affordability of, of options for carers and for uh, people being cared for, uh, what alternatives and supports are there out there in terms of uh, uh, publicly funded services, because there may be some private options, but then that just creates and exacerbates inequities. Um, so formal care alternatives and supports uh, uh, in terms of sort of government uh, uh, roles, but we can also think here of uh, caring communities and the role that that might play um, if we have uh, caring communities and, and capacities within communities um, um, that can also make caring easier. And uh, I think that anything that makes caring easier is means it's going to have a less of a negative impact on, on your health. Um, I've just added globalization in there because I think all of that at a very, very broad level is shaping um, public service uh, provision uh, in Canada and in other industrialized uh, countries as well. Um, and then the last category here that I think of is um, about designs and policies shaping the structures of our daily lives. Um, so what, what, how are, how is society structured in a way that uh, either makes providing care if you wish to, uh, or setting limits if you wish to easier? Um, and I'll touch on some more of that uh, here. Um, so I wanna end with this slide on um, thinking in, in a more tangible way about how this upstream thinking could guide action. Um, and so we see, for instance, a lot of attention to uh, assessments of individual caregivers being sort of one of the potential responses to improve caregiver health. Um, but we can also think here, but what about assessing policies, right? And so there's something called the, the CGPL series, the Caregiver Policy Lens developed by um, McCourt and Krawczyk. Um, which was used as a way to help policymakers assess um, the sort of impacts of different policies um, on uh, carers. Um, we currently have an approach which is uh, in terms of financial impacts and, and burdens of um, you know, providing tax credits, possibly allowances. Um, there is potential in things like care leave legislation. Um, I believe Alison Williams has looked at the compassionate care benefit, um, but concluded that it, it was in fact, there was potential in it as a public health intervention, but that it was uh, just not well developed enough uh, and easily enough to be accessed in order to have it, its most potential. So, uh, and, and if we wanna think at an extreme level here too, what about universal basic income, right? And those sorts of things. Um, how can we move, for instance, from supporting people to better navigate systems through, you know, providing information or better websites to a system that itself uh, is more integrated that would itself create, generate less carer burden um, uh, because they do experience that as quite burdensome to navigate systems. Um, how can we move from sort of patchwork supports for a few caregivers to very strong publicly funded services for care recipients? The Canadian Centre for Caregiving Excellence is promoting um, that piece, which is great to see. Um, and ha then how can we support choice and independence uh, through services and through public services uh, for both families and uh, for people receiving care? And then the last point here was just a reverend, maybe more provocative around, I mean, maybe we need to view this or envision this, this as not just a health issue, right? It's, it's really a social citizenship issue. Um, and there are, have been efforts recently to move towards uh, politicizing and mobilizing around care more broadly as a, as a public issue of concern um, between care recipients, carers, and, uh, and paid carers as well, paid and unpaid carers. All right, and then I think that's about my time up and thank you for, your, for having me. Thank you so much for that presentation, Laura. That's um, 
really fascinating some of the points you brought up, especially the idea of supporting not only people in providing caregiving, but also setting those boundaries and not providing caregiving when it's not appropriate for them or they don't want to or are unable to. So I think that's a really, um, really great presentation and overview that you've given. Our next presenter is going to be Dr. Katie Auber, and she's a Canadian Research Chair in Health Equity and Social Justice, and also an Associate Professor of Sociology at St. Francis Xavier University in Nova Scotia. And she's the Director of the Spatializing Care Intersectional Disability Studies Lab, where she leads an interdisciplinary research program that maps resources, services, and policies related to mental health, virality, and resilience in Atlantic Canada with a focus on dementia and caregiving. So welcome, Katie. Hello, thank you. Um, oh, here, so I'll just, uh, uh, even with the trial run of the screen share, I might need a, a, a moment here, let's see. There we go. I think you can see my screen. Is that correct? Wonderful. Thank you so much, Laura. And thanks uh, for the invitation to join you today on the webinar. And everyone, thank you, Laura um, Funk, for your excellent presentation. Um, and so in, uh, in my uh, presentation, I'm going to consider the rural context um, and think with equity, rurality, and resilience. And you know what would a health, equitable health promoting approach look like? I think a part of it um, involves really resisting um, reacting to situations that that we observe in research with caregivers and developing uh, a kind of reflexive response. Um, so I'm joining you from uh, Antigonish, which is in rural northeastern Nova Scotia. Um, this territory is Mi'kma'ki, the unceded and ancestral territory of the Mi'kmaq. Uh, and, um, and it's important to, to acknowledge that we are all treaty people. Um, so uh, I know that in the book uh, that this series is based on, there is a consideration of the strengths of thinking across uh, different disciplinary or interdisciplinary fields, such as social gerontology and health promotion. Um, in my own work, I, I, I think about um, the benefits of, uh, of a transdisciplinary approach that involves aging and caregiving studies informed by lessons from disability studies. Um, and so something that, I, that I've that uh, i observed as, as essential, I think within uh, a, a kind of reflexive approach to resilience um, within the context of caregiving, especially caregiving for people with dementia, um, is, uh, is attention to um, that, that rights-based approach that Laura talked about, um, and also kind of resisting um, an understanding of adversity as something as a kind of bouncing back. Um, and so uh, within this presentation, um, I'm going to offer uh, a, an invitation to imagine resilience uh, in terms of supported caregiving. Uh, so within disability studies, um, there is a whole body of work around supported decision making. And, um, and I, time is not permitted, doesn't permit me to go into that today, but um, I'd like us just to, to think with a specific project that we conducted here in, no in rural Nova Scotia um, during the COVID-19 pandemic that was funded by Research Nova Scotia, um, which examined dementia care uh, under COVID-19. Um, and, um, and through this project, we learned quite a lot about um, the conditions that uh, we might need to uh, start to uh, create and support and sustain, which could promote self-advocacy and self-determination um, in caregivers and caregiving and community. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about my, uh, what I call my caregiving research compass and ethnographic sensibility that guides all of my work um, as part of this. Um, and so an ethnographic sensibility um, is really steeped in, uh, in a, a cultural understanding of caregiving. Um, 
here, you know, with ethnography, we're always kind of taken with, um, uh, you know, a, a, an interest. We're inspired by knowing a world from the standpoint of its social rela relations. Again, something um, that Laura had mentioned in her presentation. And as part of this, um, we really, you know, focus on a place and population based approach um, in looking at caregiving situations um, uh, in a way that recognizes um, their social, cultural, and historic specificity, and really ensuring that the work is lived experience led. Um, so this project that I described, um, it had uh, the overall objective of understanding the impact of COVID-19 policy responses on dementia care and community in Nova Scotia. Um, although we did include urban Halifax, Nova Scotia is primarily a rural, uh, a, a, has a, a, you know, I think it's a, more than half of our population um, are rural. Um, in this work, we adopted an intersectional health equity analytic framework. Um, and um, while I'll go through the project in greater detail, uh, just to kind of get us thinking about this reflexive response, um, you know, our, generally our results were not surprising, I'm sure. It was that there were COVID-19 care disparities that existed across the pro province, particularly um, for people in rural communities, um, and that they reflected social inequities. So we saw that there were unmet needs prior to the pandemic. Um, there was this uh, assumption that, you know, people within rural communities are just naturally more resilient um, and, um, and that part of this has to do with the kind of traditional family structure. And, and, and so that assumption also um, put the onus on families to provide care. Um, there was an erasure uh, as part of that of family dynamics and family violence. Um, there, you know, th there were issues in terms of differences in income and access to, to housing that we learned about income, um, food, medication, medical equipment, education and access to information as well as transfer transportation. Um, and then ageism, ableism, racism, classism, heterosexism and xenophobia. So xenophobia were all came into play. Um, and um, we know that Nova Scotia, as with many other provinces, is experiencing, you know, um, significant issues in terms of um, the health system uh, with, you know, a crisis that we see worldwide, really, with the health human resource uh, uh, health human resources um, and, and something that is especially difficult for rural communities. So in the research and the research evidence that we reviewed for this project, there was always a like this call that we heard over and over again for more, more research, more regulation, more surveillance, more data, more services, more supports, and that this was equity. Like in order to achieve equity, we need all of this more for these groups that are experiencing um, disparities. And, and this really made us pause to consider how might this kind of reaction reproduce the problem? Are the potential benefits from these kinds of responses equally enjoyed by all? And we thought, no, actually they tend to be, uh, the benefits tend to really be for the researchers that are doing this equity-based work, um, but, but also for specific populations. And then could any uh, anyone be harmed? And how, are impacted people and communities reacting um, to this reaction? And certainly we had an advisory group that were reacting to what we were sharing back and saying, you know, we need to see a difference in our lives. Um, so that would be, you know, the first step, not, not necessarily more research. Um, so uh, as part of this project, which was multi-pronged and a rapid research project, we um, conducted a, a, a Joanna Briggs Institute scoping review, which was, uh, we used the, uh, you know, an, an equity lens to, to guide that scoping review. And it was on research that was published in the first wave of the pandemic. So the first four to six months, we did an environmental scan of support supports and services for care people with dementia receiving care in the community and their caregivers. We conducted interviews, online surveys, and a policy scan, all of which was um, framed by a sex and gender-based 
analytical approach, which allowed us to think through these, these issues of specificity, culture, history, um, uh, and uh, social location. We also used um, the health equity impact assessment tool developed by the Ontario Ministry of Health um, and the workbook template and supplements um, that accompanied that tool. Um, this uh, It is available um, on the Government of Ontario website. Um, we even thought, you know, used these resources to help us uh, develop our questions questionnaires for our surveys and our interviews, um, and it informed um, our scoping review. Um, and um, as, as part of this work in the policy scan, we reviewed 135 um, different acts um, in the uh, Nova Scotia context um, that might be potentially dementia care and caregiving relevant, um, and ended up including 66 uh, 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 pieces of policy, um, and um, and we found that you know during COVID nineteen the only change that occurred um, uh, was that uh, there was an expansion in um, what's called the supportive care program in Nova Scotia, which is a program where um, people who are living with significant dementia um, are uh, a, a, and and have an, a caregiver that co resides with them can actually access up to $1,000 a month plus no removal costs. Um, the money is or the funds are in their name. So it preserves the, the kind of personhood and citizenship of the person with dementia, their, their separateness. Um, but it's administered through the caregiver. Um, really, it supports the caregiver as well. Um, we also found in the scan that policies with the greatest potential impact to promote health equity um, were being underutilized. And so, for example, many of these were um, policies that had a cultural dimension or that provided um, opportunities um, for people from community to be part of decision-making processes. Um, the environmental scan, we realized, as with many caregivers, that uh, it's very challenging to not only to access information, but even to know where to look. And this is um, all the more so within rural communities where word of mouth is often the most effective way of communicating. Um, we learned from our scoping review that in the first six months of the pandemic, there were almost no publications on COVID-19 service changes related to dementia care in the community. Um, and really that equity was not uh, considered. Uh, in what did exist, and it was primarily commentaries, there was unsurprisingly an emphasis on online solutions. Um, and so here is a publication that came from the scoping review and one of the, the passages from the publication uh, in the first wave of the pandemic, there were limited findings on the impact of COVID-19 uh, on mental health services and supports for people living with dementia and caregivers. It, this despite concerns over caregiver burnout uh, and anxiety uh, as growing and intensifying during the pandemic. Um, and in our surveys that we conducted, we learned that really, you know, the, the, many things, but one of the things most relevant, I think, for the discussion today um, is that caregivers were, you know, identified that they also had to provide, not only were they experiencing mental health challenges, but they had to provide mental health supports for the person whose care that they were supporting, which was often a spouse, um, and that they didn't feel that they were adequately prepared to do that in a crisis situation. Um, in our interviews, and we spoke with 31 people, um, we learned that, you know, there is really kind of a two-dimensional approach to care that has, and this there's this giant emphasis on keeping people at home as long as possible. Um, but then as one caregiver said, well, is it just sort of to keep people alive and stasis in their home. We don't have the supports that we need. We need a multidimensional approach also that addresses the complexity of our lived lives. Um, we heard of what one person referred to as a remote caregiving tax, um, where, um, you know, as this uh, male spousal caregiver from a remote Cape Breton said, 
when you live out in the boonies, you don't get the services. Um, and, um, and that every time that he would call different places to try and get supports and services or learn about what he could do, um, he was kind of given an apology. I'm sorry, like we can't help you or we can't do that or we can't get there. Um, and when he tried to connect with people in his community, when he was able to access some individualized funding, um, really the people in the community weren't able to support him um, and this was in part too because of um, their own economic situations where they may have been reliant on unemployment insurance and accepting cash which required a receipt would have um, impacted them in negative ways. Um, in rural communities in rural Nova Scotia, um, there is, you know, not only an aging population, and in Nova Scotia, we have some of the highest rates of disability in the province as well, or in the country as well. Um, but there is, uh, you know, there's, there's outward migration. So there's this emphasis on family caregiving, um, but significant changes to the family. Um, and so people don't have access to supports and services. Um, and even when things like direct are provided or available, um, they're often not for services within the local community. And so at the beginning, I talked about supported um, caregiving. Um, and um, this really is related to this idea that, you know, if we're going to have these aging in place policies um, that are promoted, or if this is going to be something that is promoted, we need to be able to support caregivers where they are. Um, and that this, you know, there's different ways of supporting people, but it's two big ones that had come up in our conversations were specialized medical equipment and home adaptations. Um, so, uh, um, people were talking about being adaptive, resilient, trying to make the best of their situations with what they had access to in their homes, um, but really struggling and that this was not creating a safe environment for either them or the people that whose care they were supporting. Um, another thing that had come up that was important was, you know, the real lack of opportunities for conversation and co-learning among people living with dementia, their caregivers, and also those care providers, so those agencies um, uh, or other types of providers that support both caregivers and people with dementia. Um, and, um, and so a social worker, a community support worker said, you know, there's a whole kind of spiritual interpersonal dimension that gets lost um, in policy and program. Um, and uh, when we're dealing with um, uh, something complex like caregiving and um, which, and we know that there are disparities um, that result from systemic inequities um, that, uh, that we need to kind of open up forums and spaces for conversation. So lots of learning. Now, where do we go from here? Um, I think a equitable health promoting approach um, would involve programs that address a broad scope of needs, physiological, psychosocial, spiritual, environmental, and financial, but that are connected and collected um, for people. You know, we heard a lot about the need for a one-stop shop. Um, and again, this isn't new, but what would that look like to be able to, to have a package that's pre-made? Um, we need to resource those community networks that support contact and connection, uh, communicate information about resources and resources hubs using those local forms of communication. So print media, radio, television, libraries, grocery stores, local champions. We need sustainable approaches to digital solutions that actually, and by this I mean that we can't just um, offer, you know, telehealth or virtual uh, supports um, because we also would need to have things like can people access devices and training so that they can build literacy um, or have internet spaces. And we're starting to see Nova Scotia Health do that in libraries, in rural communities in the province. Um, and then we need meaningful engagement. I think of social workers in all stages of program planning and delivery because they do have that multifaceted approach as well as rural perspectives in provincial and national decision-making and enhanced intra and cross-sectoral collaboration and communication. Um, so uh, I'll end there and uh, really excited um, uh, to, for the Q&A and also to hear from colleagues. Um, thank you. Thank you so much for that presentation, Katie. Uh, that really struck me that slide that you had about the survey you did where the home care um, was clearly the a big gap and 
it was really great how you were able to elaborate on those tensions between wanting people to age in place and stay in home, but not providing the proper supports for them. So our next presenter is going to be Dr. Jennifer Bombush, and she's a professor and CIHR chair in sex and gender science at the University of British Columbia's School of Nursing. Jennifer's research and scholarship focuses on enhancing person and family-centered care for older adults and people with lifelong disabilities. And her current research focuses on the impacts of the pandemic on persons living with dementia and their care partners, as well as children with medical complexity and their families. And she recently received a grant from the Canadian Institutes of Health Research to explore climate resilience among older Canadians during climate-related extreme weather events. And she's also on the editorial boards of The Gerontologist and the Journal of Family Nursing and is associate editor of the International Journal of Older People Nursing. So welcome, Jennifer. Thank you so much. I really appreciate being in involved in this panel and um, the talks so far have been really thought provoking. So I'm looking forward to sharing my piece. Oops, there we go. So before starting, um, I'd just like to acknowledge that I'm joining today from the traditional lands of the Coast Salish people and um, specifically the Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh. So I was really um, pleased to be invited to join you today to talk about a new area of work that I'm involved in around climate resilience in older people. Over the past week, the planet has experienced the two hottest days on record. And um, never in my life of being a nurse that cares for older people did I think that I would become involved in research around climate change. Um, that wasn't on my radar, but things that happened during uh, the past few years have brought it to the fore. So today I'm going to share with you some of the, um, the things that have come up over the past couple of years in my research, some of the things I've learned through community work and literature reviews, and talking about next steps in this area of research. So I called this C-Cube today, caregiving, COVID, and climate emergencies. And I think that this is something that's going to be impacting all of us working in this space for the coming generations. Um, and it's something that we need to consider. And also the consideration that, um, you know, none of these things are happening in a vacuum by themselves. And so we need to really look at the intersections and the overlaps between major phenomena. And one of them is caregiving, another was COVID-19, and then the third is the climate emergencies that we've been experiencing here in British Columbia, Canada. So for those of you who may or may not be familiar, um, during the summer of 2021, the Vancouver area where I live was really hit with what I call a triple whammy in terms of climate emergencies. So we had what was called a heat dome, and that was a big learning curve for all of us, where for the first time, really, our temperatures were reaching up to 40 degrees. It was incredibly hot, humid, and a lot of challenges um, around just surviving. And if you're familiar with the um, the news, we've just passed the anniversary where 619 people died during that heat dome due to heat illness and um, the effects of heat on their bodies. So we first experienced that and then it was quickly followed by wildfires. And I know many people across Canada are experiencing wildfires right now. And so those of you who are there and are experiencing it, you know that it has a huge impact on air quality. And so that's one piece of it. And the other piece of it is around the need to evacuate. And so that is a huge issue for people who are care partners and people living with dementia who need to consider what they're going to do in those situations. And then the third thing that happened quickly overlapping with the wildfires was again something new to our language that we weren't familiar with is something called an atmospheric river and that is heavy 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 rain for um, several days in a row and during that we had flooding um, particularly in the Fraser Valley areas of the province and roads were taken out we had 
no contact with the interior of British Columbia because our highways were washed away. And so again, all of a sudden you had the situation that no one was really ready for, knew what to do, where not only did we not have the ability or capacity to evacuate because there were no roads, there were issues around getting essential supplies to those communities that were now cut off. So that was our summer. Um, and I think Lots has come from that and still needs to come from that in terms of policies and programs. So while this was all happening, I was conducting a longitudinal qualitative study of um, living in the community uh, with dementia and the experiences of care partners in that. And what started as a study to really look at, okay, well, how do we support community-based living and aging in place for people living with, with dementia turned into how does that happen during COVID? And I think um, Katie and Laura have already started to talk about this and it, it certainly reshaped things because a lot of the resources that people may have been able to access within their homes and communities were all of a sudden not happening. So into all of this situation, and then, sorry, you also had with COVID, um, people still at that period of time doing self-isolation and not being out in community that much. So you had people who were living at home with dementia, very isolated in that situation with their care partners and very limited supports either coming in or that they could go out to. And then we had our heat dome. So this is a story of one family um, that was involved in our study at that time. And so it was a group of adult siblings living together and one of the adult siblings had uh, dementia. And so before the heat dome, they were all living together in a home and it was mainly one brother and a sister caring for their brother living with dementia. And at that time, the community-based out-of-home day programs were closed due to the COVID pandemic. So there weren't things for people to go out to do. And then in terms of home support workers coming in, that was happening, but on a fairly limited basis. But um, this family did have access to some of that resource. And then during the heat dome, what had happened was, was quite typical actually for families is that there was unreliable home support staffing. So during the three or four days of extreme heat, the usual support worker who worked with the brother who had dementia wasn't available. And so they had a new person coming in. And so part of the triggering effects of the situation was that that new person didn't know the brother's typical behaviors, didn't know how to identify changes in those behaviors. And so over the course of the days, the brother was starting to suffer the um, consequences of heat illness, but it wasn't entirely noticeable because people with dementia can present differently in heat illness. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, and it wasn't until really the sister started experiencing cardiac uh, issues that um, the emergent and acute of the situation became apparent. And so the other thing that happened during the heat dome was people were calling 911 and they were not getting a response. And so the sister experienced a cardiac arrest at home. The family phoned uh, 911 three or four times over the course of an hour or two. Uh, no one came and the sister died at home. And about 10 minutes after she passed away at home, the first emergency responders arrived. And so um, as a consequence of that, the brother with dementia was transferred to hospital where he was found to be severely dehydrated and experiencing other effects of heat illness. And ultimately he was not able to return home to continue living in the sibling's household, but was moved into a long-term care home. So you can see that everything that could have happened, happened in this situation of overlapping crises, emergencies, and a system that was very restricted in terms of resources due to the pandemic. And um, really at the end showed this very tenuous situation for people living with dementia in the community at home with their care partners. So this happened. And um, for our research team, it was very shocking, obviously. And we provided supports to the family as best as we could. Um, but it kind of threw me into this new world that I've talked about because I didn't know anything about really 
well, I knew what I saw on the news about climate change, um, but really wasn't familiar with a lot of the ideas around how do we mobilize during climate change? How do we build climate resilience? And I found myself looking around to who are the experts in this area and um, really found myself being drawn into this area because it was affecting so many people within my research program at the same time. So I got myself into the news a bit, started to learn more about it. And so um, I'm going to share a bit about what I've learned around the susceptibility of people living with dementia during climate events. The first one is during heat events. And we really need to take into account heat and humidity during this. And some of the unique things, so we think about the older adult population in general, that impacts a lot of care partners, but also in particular for people with dementia, they may have particular challenges around temperature regulation. They may experience reduced sweating. They can experience dehydration more quickly, therefore. Some of the medications that people with dementia are taking can impact them during the heat and make them more susceptible to heat illness. And then there are the behavioral changes. And so within a person living with dementia, one of the main signs that something has changed for them may be behavioral changes. And we know that our health system is not great about recognizing that behavioral changes can be a sign of acute illness. So this makes them particularly vulnerable during these situations. And I've kind of combined wildfires and flooding. During these situations, we really have to consider things like air quality, evacuation. There's research, um, particularly from Hurricane Katrina and from wildfires in Australia around the unique challenges of evacuation for people living with dementia and their care partners in terms of accessibility and suitability of evacuation plans. We can have loss of access to roads um, and inaccessible healthcare services. And so this is something that we definitely saw during these climate emergencies was that healthcare providers weren't able to get to provide in-home services, but also people couldn't get to their hospitals. So I had people contact contacting me because they knew I was doing a little bit of work in this area to say, you know, I need to get um, to the hospital for dialysis, but the road's out and it's flooded. What do we do? So really thinking about, you know, the communication and the plans that we have in place for these kinds of emergencies was non-existent. Some of the additional factors that can increase susceptibility during um, these kinds of events, and this is considered to be factors that contribute to something called climate vulnerability, are gender, so women tend to be more impacted, people with low income, people who are in inadequate housing. So during our heat dome, many people who died didn't have access to mechanical cooling or air conditioners um, and lived in situations where there wasn't a lot of air exchange and it got very, very hot inside. Transportation availability, a lot of our evacuation plans rely on people having access to their own vehicles. And of course, as we're aging, we may not be driving as much um, and that just might not be a possibility. And then capacity within the healthcare system. And there are significant issues um, within the healthcare system in terms of just availability, but also having providers who have the knowledge and expertise to work with the older adult population and people living with dementia specifically. So how do we build climate resilience among this population? And so this again is a bit of what I've learned from the literature and doing systematic literature review and also from community groups who have been working really hard over the past few years to build these systems into place. And I really like to think about these in terms of individual community and government. I think we need to be working at every level so that we can actually make structural changes and we're going to need to make structural changes to keep people safe during climate events. So in terms of individual levels, when you are a care partner um, or working with someone living with dementia to really know their signs and symptoms of heat illness. It may be a bit different than what it looks like in the typical person. Um, and so really understanding what that might be. Having good cooling and hydration strategies within your own home or within your community. Um, decreased activities. So for caregivers, you might be providing a lot of hands-on care, doing meal prep, and caregivers need to think about themselves as well in order to decrease their um, stress on their cardiovascular and respiratory systems. And then always thinking about doing medication reviews with pharmacists, their key partner, and can really help people understand any impacts of their medications on them during heat events. 
in terms of communities, there's been a lot of community grassroots work in this area in southwestern British Columbia. Um, there are things like neighbor check-ins, distributing fans and other cooling devices, um, and then having accessible cooling centers. And you'll notice on all my points, I talk about accessibility. This is a huge issue because it's not one that's necessarily well thought through when some of these strategies are being developed and implemented. In terms of the government level, um, mechanical cooling, I lived in Ontario for two years, many, many years ago, and was so surprised that so many people have air conditioning in their house. And that's not the norm where I am. So it needs to evolve and become the norm. And that will require changes in building codes and strata laws. And then we also need to think about the power infrastructure and ensuring that we have power systems that can accommodate um, these demands during hot weather. And then shifting to the wildfires, again, in-home air quality, having access to purifiers, closing windows, et cetera, having an evacuation plan and a go bag, and really thinking, what does that evacuation plan look like for you? Um, in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina, families were required to have evacuation plans as part of their care plans on record with their local health authorities. That's not something I'm aware of is happening yet in Canada. In terms of community, mobilizing community supports and agencies around evacuation readiness, and also thinking about um, that trauma of evacuating or having an emergency and making sure people have spaces to debrief about it with their community partners. And then in terms of the government level, again, having accessible evacuation transportation and centers. To go to a large evacuation center can be extremely stressful for people living with dementia. There's a lot of sensory inputs. It's an unfamiliar environment. And so some caregivers in the research have talked about having to make the choice between evacuating and staying at home. Um, and they say, you know, I could evacuate myself, but the person I'm caring for could not handle it. So making sure that we have systems and structures in place that people can safely evacuate. And then again here, making sure that people have access to funding for air purifiers. And the flooding is fairly similar, I think, in terms of having a risk assessment and evacuation plan. Limiting exposure to media and about the weather event is one suggestion in the literature, just because it can create a lot of anxiety just to have that 24-hour news cycle going on for people. Within the community, one of the recommendations in the literature is for people who are living in long-term care to look at whether there's a um, possibility of staying with family temporarily. And so thinking about that possibility and some of the uh, policies and structures that need to be in place to ensure that people have a safe place to stay during a climate emergency. And then in terms of the government, making sure that people have access to medication and medical supply reserves. Um, lots of us are on 30 day prescriptions and we don't have a little backup. And so this is an issue during these types of events. And so making sure that people can have accessible um, medication and medical equipment um, if they're not able to access it through the usual channels. And then the prioritization for evacuation. One of the issues that has come up here is just that when people with disabilities are evacuating, there's no accessible rooms available anymore at hotels because they're not reserved for people with disabilities. They just fill up on a first come first serve basis. So really thinking through how do we prioritize populations during these events to make sure that they can leave safely? And so as Laura mentioned in my um, introduction, this is a new world for me, but I have um, received a grant from the Canadian Institutes of Health Research to work on with partners at McGill University to look at what's happening during extreme weather emergencies. And some of the irony is this was funded last year and now we're looking at the wildfires that are happening in Quebec and rethinking our data collection plan because we know that we need to be able to be responsive and flexible to what is happening um, across Canada. And so part of this will involve a policy scan to look at how people, older people are included in um, different policies around uh, climate events, doing uh, some literature review work to see what has been happening internationally? The short answer is not a lot. Um, even though older people are among the most impacted populations during weather events, and then doing focus groups with older people, care partners, and people who work with this population. And the real focus areas for us are around Metro Vancouver and Montreal at this point in time. 
So thank you so much. If you have any questions or you'd like to learn more about our ongoing research, please feel free to email me. I'm happy to put you on our newsletter list and continue this conversation. And um, I will close there. Thank you. All right, thank you so much for your presentation, Jennifer, and certainly very a, a very timely topic, as I've heard that apparently this week was one of the days was the hottest on record. So um, I, unfortunately, I think we'll be seeing more heat domes or wildfires and other climate emergencies. Um, now, unfortunately, our fourth presenter, Zelda, just recently had a power outage occur at her home. So she's currently disconnected from the internet and not sure if she'll be able to get back on. Um, so in that case, I'm thinking that we can move on to the question and answer period. And then if Zelda's able to join um, in and get back on the internet, then we can have her present. So. Um, yeah, that's unfortunate, but of course, those sorts of emergencies and accidents and things happen. So we'll just continue on. And I'm sure Zelda's presentation would have been very wonderful, of course. So for the Q&A period, if you have any questions for our presenters, feel free to put them in them into the Q&A box, or you can also put them into the chat. So I'll open that up to the audience. And um, I don't think we have any questions in the chat box yet. So maybe to start off us off then, I'll start off with one question. So in the presentations, I noticed that, of course, the impacts of COVID-19 have been mentioned um, quite a bit. And of course, there's been a lot of impacts for um, caregivers. And so I wanted to ask, um, regarding the COVID-19 um, pandemic, obviously there were many negative impacts on caregivers, um, but did you see any examples of where the COVID-19 pandemic has actually helped to move um, policy or programming forward for caregiving? And if there have been any positive initiatives or um, changes that have resulted from it? I can um, I can take a first a first step uh, if that's okay. So thank you. That's an excellent question. And and one of the I think yes, absolutely. Um, one of the um, uh, kind of really innovative approaches uh, that uh, that came out of COVID nineteen at the community level that we learned about through um, the project that I described. Um, was where there was a, a group that was meeting um, a, a group of older people and their caregivers within a, a small rural community just outside of urban Halifax, um, where they'd kind of gather and uh, do dance movements. It was like an exercise class, but not so structured or rigid. Um, and so when COVID-19 happened, it really, um, uh, you know, made it impossible to move forward with that program. Um, it was something that people found really essential in terms of maintaining their connections and their sense of the, themselves, as well as having a positive interaction and relationship um, with the person whose cares that, that they were supporting. And, um, and so this group that had organized the program, uh, as with so many others, pivoted and tried to do it online with Zoom, but it didn't work <laughs> because uh, of in, like internet co connectivity issues. And also people didn't really know how to use the technology, like to get in the room, let alone, you know, um, be able to use it to kind of set up a dance scene. And they had this like really this, uh, I think, ambitious idea of having all of the, our, the people's the boxes up like we have on the Zoom right now and people would dance and move. So it didn't work at all. Um, but what they ended up doing, and it wasn't intentional, was that they used the space and for the, the few that were able to connect to learn about what was happening in their communities, to share information about who didn't have heat, right, in, in, during the winter months or the colder months, who needed food. And then they started creating these baskets with gas cards and food and dropping them off or if somebody didn't hear from someone in a while. And so what we saw was not necessarily like a new program addressing a new need, but that the COVID-19 pandemic changed 
changes catalyzed a shift in terms of how they were relating with one another. And we saw more creative relationships that actually were, for the most part, more health promoting. So really exciting. And they've sustained that post pandemic. That's really fascinating. Thank you for sharing that. I wonder if I could just follow up on that with you, Katie, did, did that, it sounds like it was kind of an organic um, solution to isolation and uh, lack of information. Is that kind of program possible to duplicate? Because what I'm hearing, especially, I, I really found Jennifer's talk quite alarming in terms of the number of people that are in crisis during the heat dome, which is hitting us right now, uh, the flooding, the fires, how is it possible to communicate and prioritize the needs of um, vulnerable people, including those with dementia, but I mean, it, it doesn't stop there. It's also children and disabled people. So I'm wondering about this whole idea of getting information to the right people so they can get the support and help they need. I think that's a critical issue that seems to be kind of across the board, not just with people with dementia and their caregivers, but also their families. Yeah, um, so I'll respond quickly and then I'll leave, I'll open it up to others, but um, thank you. That's an excellent question. Um, I think it was really about that there was, rather than having it be like a program, they tried to do something that they overplanned and it failed, right? And they tried to, to kind of use, to go the approach that everyone was with the virtual and it failed for all the reasons they knew it would. But then it was like something beautiful happened in the failure. And so maybe it's less of a program and more of an orientation. Like, how are we thinking about what happens at the local? How do we create those spaces for people to connect on a human level? And just quickly, there is a project that was on um, evacuation um, for persons with disabilities in Nova Scotia, led by um, Kevin Quigley at the McCacken uh, Institute um, for Public Policy. And um, during one of the advisory meetings, and I'll let Kevin know I said this, but there was somebody from the Canadian Centre on Disability um, and uh, uh, Studies, and they said, we use the phone tree. Like for people who are really kind of not connecting through Twitter or LinkedIn or whatever, it's calling people they know. And that's what we heard was that it's word of mouth. So how do we create those local spaces and those translocal connections that will support people? And then just an example, uh, again, local, Anne Kamosi is a local um, local to Antigonish disability activist and, and accessibility champion. Um, and she's really kind of um, started a whole movement in the province around vulnerable persons registries that are local to communities. So not like something through government where people are on lists, but that people can self-identify within their community. Um, and I think that's where that there's that support and there's that self-determination that's pre preserved that can get lost when it becomes too standardized and too big. Uh, how do you scale and spread that? I don't know, <laughs> but, uh, but thank you for your question. Thank you. I guess I would just add, this is um, just to resonate with what Katie had said, and I want to give a shout out to our neighborhood houses here in British Columbia. I think this is an important network of grassroots community organizations, and during our experiences of the heat dome, I live in Burnaby, and our Burnaby neighborhood house has really mobilized older people, and so they took their existing seniors groups, and they started to do more outreach, and so I think this is where also mobilizing older people who are involved in their communities and can spot that person who might not be as connected in, because the reality is our health services, as Laura said, have eroded so much. The only people that are connected in with our health authorities are those who reach a very high bar of need. And all of those people who are living in inadequate housing, low poverty, fixed incomes, pensions, they're not too sick to be involved in the healthcare system. Um, they're really not getting caught necessarily. So it is things like 
you know, the grocery store clerk who notices that a person hasn't been by or like all of those very, um, those things that we can't formalize necessarily or fund, but are happening at the community level. But I think then recognizing and supporting those nonprofits that are doing that work, right? And certainly within particular groups, there are strong Facebook groups. So we talk about the telephone tree. I'm very involved with families of children with disabilities. We're very connected on Facebook. And then the people who are on Facebook, somebody's got a number for them. So there are these informal ways. Um, and I don't know that they all need to be overly formalized. I think our government could do a much better job around communication, around supporting financially some of these networks. Um, and that's what I think I would like to see. Thank you very much for those points, Jennifer. And we have a question in the um, chat from Judy. So I'll just read that um, question out from the Q&A. And so Judy's asking, how can I, as an individual supporting caregivers on individualized group and short-term basis, contribute to helping caregivers upstream or influence policy? So if anybody would like to take a stab at that one. Oh, Laura? Yeah, and I, I think that's a, a great question because, yeah, ideally we'd, we'd want to work at both, right? We need to kind of help caregivers who are really struggling right now, who need some, you know, in our capacity that we can, as especially as service providers. Um, but then, you know, it, sometimes when it comes to policy, there's that sense of, oh, it's kind of overwhelming, right? And there's lots of barriers to some of those changes I was sort of suggesting, right? Like there is, um, you know, political, economic sorts of, of, of barriers to some of those things. They're not, you know, there's not a lot of research around them because they're also, it's easier to kind of test an intervention, right? And, and so forth. Um, so, you know, if we're, if we're committed to that, those kinds of uh, upstream uh, thinking and, and policy change that would, uh, you know, suggest involvement within like broader social movements, right? Uh, and so the sort of um, social movement around the, what we call the care economy, where that's the kind of a broad base of, of uniting like those who are advocating for family caregivers alongside care recipients and, and paid care staff uh, is, is something that would be, that has promise. Um, and I know the Canadian Centre for Caregiving Excellence is trying to sort of um, shift things a little bit in that regard, like uh, to, to, to bring those considerations together of, of all of those different groups, right, to um, advocate for, for policy change. Um, they just published a white paper and, and, and they're welcoming sort of um, the involvement of, of individuals, right, who, who kind of want to contribute in some way to, um, to those more political sorts of, of efforts. Yeah, and then I, I suppose the other piece is around the, you know, just supporting the caring communities piece, right, that we've just been talking about and how, you know, maybe it's, it's the political work around advocating for funding for those kinds of networks or um, I, I think that those organic responses are so um, important and, and then I worry, though, about those who don't have access to them, right? And, and, and so how that's why both the state and the community responses are essential. And Laura, maybe you could put in the chat uh, the link to that organization that you mentioned and their white paper, because I think some of the audience might be interested. And um, Katie or Jennifer, if you'd like to add anything in and also just um, kind of follow up question as well is um, in terms of advocating for those upstream policy solutions. I'm wondering also if you have any um, examples that you've seen where there has been effective advocacy to um, scale up programs or have policy changes put in place. So just to add in that question to the mix as well. Uh, Jennifer, I think you had your yeah. hand up. Uh, and this is partly in your question at the start too, Laura. In British Columbia, I think a really good example of this is the updated legislation around family and resident councils in long-term care. So we saw huge devastation in this sector during the pandemic. And pre-pandemic, there was already a group of family members, one in particular, Kim Slater, who were advocating at the government level for changes in the legislation. And just recently, um, we did have the legislation revised and updated. So we now have a much more formalized system of family council connections that aren't reliant on the long-term care sector per se. And we have more similarly to 
Ontario, but not yet funded like Ontario, where we have a provincial association, we have representatives for each, from each group. I think part of that was that families got shut out of long term care and were like, wait, we have no standing, like we need a group. And so it really push people towards coming together around that. And I think that can work in other aspects of community-based care as well. And so really looking to your family leaders who are committed to this because it's had such an impact in their life. And what I see oftentimes is for people who are in the paid roles to help facilitate those connections because it is really hard in our environment of privacy and we can't share information and you can't talk to each other. And you have all these people working very individually around advocacy and having different energy levels at different points in time. And when we can see finally those people coming together, we can see some of that real political movement happening. So building those connections, I think, is so key. Um, and working with those leaders who are the unpaid people that are, you know, there are lots of leaders in um, our care partner community uh, who are doing this kind of work, people living with dementia, and how do we support them and help them build their network. And I think that's where we build the capacity to have these uh, political upstream changes taken place. And I might add to that if if that's okay too. And, and I'll go back to something that you said, Jennifer, which I think is like extremely important. And it's um, the potential of accessibility legislation, I think is huge. And we saw this in our policy scan that, um, uh, so we were looking, you know, we used the health equity impact assessment tool and we plotted out, you know, read through and did a content analysis of all of these like laws that had teeth, regulatory power in the province. And it like checked, 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 checked. But when you talk about it, and it's fairly new in Nova Scotia, ours is 2017. I think you have an, an even newer one uh, that's uh, in development in British Columbia. And, and it's in place in Ontario, Manitoba as well, and uh, Newfoundland and Labrador, that there's there's talk where it isn't. Um, it's not really, it, it doesn't, it's not circulating. You know, and it was what Laura said that underutilization, and that's what we saw. Like, there is huge potential. And so, just to give you a sense of the potential, um, you know, the accessibility legislation well, people who are caregivers are often people who also live with disability. Who are also older people who and and um, within the legislation there's an emphasis not necessarily even on the disability definition and more so on the barriers so um, if you experience barriers um, uh, people with dementia uh, also there's a shift towards understanding dementia from a disability perspective um, so these barriers could be po policy barriers environmental environmental barriers technical uh, technological barriers communication barriers um, but policy as well. And so some of those accessibility areas, employment, transportation, I mean, there's so much potential. Um, and it has that rights-based, it's grounded in equality and a rights-based um, perspective, even if it is more of a framework um, uh, legislation. So I, I, I really, I'm, I think that there's a lot there that we could do. Um, and I think that it would, um, there's a lot of potential to support caregivers as well. Thank you. All right, great. Thank you very much for sharing that about the legislation, Katie. And I noticed that um, Laura has also shared in the um, chat box some of the resources from the Canadian Caregiving uh, Center for Excellence, I believe the name is. And so that's um, a advocacy organization that I would also encourage people to check out as well. All right, and I see that our time is um, getting close to being done. So I'm going to check I don't see any more um, questions in the chat yet, um, but I'm wondering, I'll give everyone a last um, opportunity if anybody has any additional questions that they'd like to ask. Oh, Fran? Yes. Um, I've thoroughly enjoyed all of your presentations and they've been extremely informative. And I, I guess my overall question is, are you optimistic that, um, health equity and this whole idea of right, rights-based um, resourcing and care for the vulnerable, it, are we making progress um, with, it seems we, 
We're faced with even more challenges uh, environmentally now, um, not to mention the, the fact that the population is aging um, and it's, it's large. Are you optimistic that we're going to see um, better responses, better policies? Is, is government listening? Because we need we need recognition, I think, at at higher levels to even um, fund some of the research that that you've done. Um, for example, Katie in your province, um, and and Laura as well, and and both Laura's. Are we seeing movement here? That's a big question, but I'm hoping you you're saying you're going to say yes because. Wow, there's certainly a lot of challenges. Uh, the story about the family taking care of their brother, that is absolutely tragic. <laughs> Nobody wants to answer. Well, I'll, I'll jump in. Um, I think, yes, my short answer is yes. I think that we need to think about caregiving less about an aging issue. It affects all of us at all points in our life. Mm -hmm. As I said, I'm very much involved with the other end of things and being a parental caregiver. And I think we need to see ourselves as one group because it's huge and it's impacting everybody. And I think the other piece of it is that generationally, um, people, I think of the Gen Xers of which I am that are becoming the caregivers now uh, are just not having it. <laughs> And so I think, True. you know, I think there's been a wonderful foundation from each generation. And I think as we continue along, this will con like, what do you mean I can't work? What do you mean I can't access things? And like Katie said, I think the accessibility legislation across the Canada will be really key in pushing this through, not just as a um, nice to have, but as a rights-based shift in how things are going to be. And there's going to have to be some groups with deep pockets to take it through the court systems and all of those things. But I'm very hopeful um, because I think that it's on so many people's radar now. And the one thing we haven't talked about is during COVID, the caregiver benefit um, that was paid out. From my perspective, we need that to just be a standing credit in Canada and there were many mothers who are caregivers who didn't qualify because they had not been in the workplace for me that's a crack in the door and I don't know that we're talking about it enough because I think we need to push for that just to be tax breaks aren't enough if you're not making money you don't need the tax break right yeah. so how do we put money in people's pockets so they can buy groceries um, so these are the things I think that we need to collectively work on and I think um, these kinds of forums are great because they bring together people and we learn that we're all facing so many of similar issues and we can work together to really push at the provincial and the federal level I think so yes I'm hopeful for sure great thank you um and I can just share something um like I've been thinking a lot about equity. Uh, so I'm a sociologist and I'm, and so equity and then health equity. Um, and sometimes we use these terms that are actually quite abstract in really decontextualized ways. And then it's hard to know, right? Because we don't even have our goal, right? Like we're working towards say health equity for all, which is what we need to work towards. But, but, the health equity for the caregiver is not necessarily like it could be incommensurable with from health equity for the person whose care is being supported and even the language does so much to that could reflect and reproduce and reinforce inequities um and so i guess like my thoughts around your your question is just that it's a really important question to ask and that to re that one way that I am excited that I think, you know, we could have optimism is that there are lots of different perspectives coming into the conversation. So in order for us to really kind of understand what's going on and understand if we're moving the bar, we need to understand the conditions of people's lives, but we need to have the people who are impacted the most 
be able to speak to that and not only speak to it, but we need epistemic justice where they're speaking to it from their authentic, you know, knowledge and lived experience and not just a, a language that might be policy discourse or health discourse or, or, you know, mainstream public popular discourse. So, so I think I am seeing lots of different ways of thinking and new forums developing where multiple perspectives can come in and um, training through CHR, for example, and awards to help students and new people come in and, and at the provincial level. So, so I, I feel optimistic about that, but I don't know if we'll like achieve more equity. We're not gonna get more. It's just like, but things are shifting. Thank you. Mm. I can I can just add that I, I think that Jennifer and Katie have just uh, uh, given me a, a sense of optimism <laughs> uh, that as you were talking I'm like yes yes you're right you're right so I was feeling kind of pessimistic <laughs> maybe uh, originally but there are there there are changes there's changes in in sort of advocacy uh, fields and in in research um, and in funding research as well um, I think I'm I'm hopeful that some of that can start to also intersect with where I see barriers at sort of the political and, and, and governmental levels. I do have one other question. Um, is there is there there is a minister for seniors am I in Ottawa? Am I correct about that? And yeah. like, where where are they where is that person at where is her office like are they responsive are they learning are they recognizing what needs to be done in terms of um equity health equity um all the things you've talked about today are they reading the studies and are they responsive I, I certainly am not reading anything where the seniors minister is advocating for anything. Maybe I'm out of the loop, but just just wondering. I think one of the issues in our country is that um, so much of the actual programming is done through the provinces and jurisdictions. So there's, you know, I think at the federal level, people are very aspirational. I agree. I don't, you know, see in the news statements being put out by the Minister of Seniors. I think it's um, a lot is left to the provinces, which leaves a lot of cracks. And so it's, um, I think, through works like the Canadian Caregiving Centre on Excellence, I don't hope I got their name right. Like they are constantly, po they have really focused on the federal government which is fantastic um from my knowledge they're sort of the one of the first groups they're certainly national seniors groups but this is the first one i think focused on caregiving and really focusing on building connections with the federal government and it's not just the seniors right it's the ministry of labor it's the ministry of justice it's so cross-cutting across ministries that at the end of the day then everybody's like well it's not my job Mm -hmm. um so I think constantly raising those issues and you're right and as researchers we're working hard on knowledge translation at all times um but it is a group project for sure um and it's a lifetime commitment for sure so I think um I'm certainly hopeful when I'm in groups and conversations like this and looking at colleagues across the country knowing that we're all working towards a similar goal and we all support each other and I'm very hopeful that we'll see those changes ha happening. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you very much. It looks like we're um, at the end of our time, but I really want to thank our um, three presenters today for their very insightful presentations and also for this very stimulating q and I also want to thank um, Zelda, who unfortunately um, wasn't able to get her power back on, and there's an emergency at the hospital, so she has some other things she needs to do, but hopefully we can get her for a future webinar, as I'm sure it would have been really interesting to hear about her insights regarding caregiving and grief. And um, I also want to thank the audience, of course, for attending and for your great questions and attention. 
and also our um, organizing committee, Fran and Irv, who helped to organize the webinar, as well as um, Diane, who had to leave early. So thank you very much, everyone, for your time today. Uh, the recording will be made available to everyone, as well as the links that were shared in the chat. And I hope you found this as inspiring and um, useful as I did. And hopefully you'll be um, inspired to be become engaged with caregiving advocacy and some of the um, initiatives or organizations that were mentioned today. Thank you. Yeah, everyone. I'd like to thank you for doing such an excellent job at, at uh, uh, running this uh, 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 this uh, webinar. Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Yes, it's the first one I've run, so uh, a couple yeah, bumps doing, along the road, but you're, uh, you're hired. I think it's very. <laughs> you're I think great, Laura. Thank you. Thank you all. It was great. Just great. All right. Thank you so much. All right. Take care, everyone. And I hope you all have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.